within the ocean, we also find that there are other organisms deep within there, like these jellyfish, that are almost like a lantern glowing deep within the water, producing this light within their body. We have these little comb jellies. And these comb jellies, you've ever seen these before, have these lights that almost run down them as if you had turned on a switch and you see these little red dots and it goes from one end of the animal down to the other end. Why do they do this and how do they do this? Ah, <laughs> boy, now, that's not Halloween-y. <laughs> I thought it was quite interesting that they chose this topic to be close to that of Halloween. Uh, it looks like a monster, doesn't it? Yeah. Of course, this is a fish, and this fish lives, lives deep down within the ocean where there's really almost no light taking place. The light that's being produced through there is through a chemical reaction that's taking place. And what this fish does is it has this nice little uh, fishing lure, if you would, that it puts out there, illuminates some light through producing that light in his body, hence a living light. And we'll talk about why in the world this fish would have this little fishing lure out there. Back on land, you might recognize this animal sort of having a flattened out body and two pairs of legs per section. This is the millipede. This millipede is not native to our area. This is a millipede um, from actually more the southern hemisphere, if you would. Uh, but a really neat animal, uh, a millipede that bioilluminates. And you may have seen this animal before out in the woods, not the specific one, um, but it's one of our coleopterans, one of our beetles. And if you notice, it's almost as, it's got two little green globs of something on there. If you see it at night, what you would notice is those little green spots on there look like little green headlights. It's bioilluminating these two spots. It takes a lot of energy to do that. Why would this animal do that? This animal, if you saw it during the daytime, you might see it crawling around in the forest area and wonder, what in the world is this thing? But if you see it at night, you might really wonder what this might be. <laughs> Neat little animal, if you look, notice this in sort of a reddish coloration and along the sides it appears as if there's light illuminating out of small portals, if you would. It reminded someone of, of a railroad car and traveling along the tracks at night and illuminating out of these portals or these windows would be the light from within the side of the railroad car. And then, of course, at the back on that train at the caboose would be a red light. <laughs> yeah, it's called a railroad worm. Not a worm at all. <coughs> Actually turns into this. Yeah. Neat little soft-shelled beetle. Look at the size of those antennae on there. All that sort of for communication, but that came from that. Mollusk. Animals could have a shell, in this case a univalve. These mollusks too can illuminate light. They make that light within themselves. It's not a reflection. They're producing that light through a chemical reaction, which allows them to be able to produce the light. But why? Ah, mushrooms. There are many different species of fungi that do bioilluminate. Um, we're going to talk about a little later on a couple that are from our area that you might be a little more familiar with. Um, but nice coloration through there, like little lanterns, if you would. So bioluminescence, what is bioluminescence? We've, we, we've talked about that word just a little bit. It's in the literature. You've heard it before. We're going to kind of break it down. It's one of those great big long words I call a mayonnaise word. And a mayonnaise word has lots and lots of, of vowels in it and lots of consonants. And the first time you see the word mayonnaise, it's like until somebody tells you what that word is and how to pronounce it and what in the world mayonnaise is, it's sort of a foreign word to you. So I call big scientific words mayonnaise words. And we're going to kind of break them down for you a little bit. Bio, of course, means life. Pretty straightforward. Lumen comes from the word light. And essence means the state of. So the state of light from life. In other words, it's a living light. 
In bioluminescence, once again, it's not reflection or refraction of light. It's actually the production of light from that living organism through a reaction that takes place that allows that animal to really make this light, but the light really is, in essence, almost a waste product, if you want to think of it that way. It's energy that is lost. Or in this case, if you're utilizing that loss, all the other materials is really a chemical reaction. is really more your waste product. It's like when you turn a light on. You turn these lights on, we turn them on, so we have light. But we get to use all of that energy for the process or the purpose of light, do we? Some of that is lost in the form of heat. Not so much in LEDs as it used to be in the old types of lights that, that I grew up with. I like to use that example occasionally, talking about the heat coming off the light, and I'll do that with children. I have the opportunity to work with a lot of children, and I'm like, do you want to touch the light? And they're like, sure, why not? <laughs> and like, What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> do these kids want to touch a hot light? I don't understand. Then I have to think back and realize, oh, yeah, they're touching LED lights, which are much cooler because there's less energy being lost because there's less energy being consumed. Um, but these animals are actually that light as part of a chemical reaction within their body. These fungi are doing the same thing. And there are other organisms as well that bioilluminate. So what causes this to take place? Well, if we're talking about our friend the firefly, or the lightning bug, if you would. Um, by the way, is, is a firefly a fly? No, what is that? It's a beetle. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a beetle in the family Lampridae. What a great name for the family, Lampridae. Turn on a lamp, turn on a lightning bug, right? So what's happening within this area, within the tail section, the light, if you would, on here, is there's a chemical reaction that's taking place. There's several things that have to take place. Um, first of all, you have to have an enzyme, which basically catalyzes. You have to have something that causes this reaction to take place. Then you have to have the chemical um, present within there, luciferin. If I were to take the I-N off of that, <laughs> Lucifer? I told you it was kind of have a little bit of a Halloween theme going on, if you would, okay. Luciferin uh, also does have the presence of oxygen. And what takes place is within this chemical reaction with the luciferin and the oxygen being combined, that chemical reaction basically gives off or emits what we know as light. Fungi do a very similar thing. In the kingdom fungi, what you have taking place is you have an enzyme, once again, to make it happen. You have hispidin present. There's your luciferin. You have luciferase, yet another type of enzyme present. There's our oxygen, which is present. And of course, as if they go through and that reaction takes place, you have a double reaction. Reaction here, then this reaction takes place but both end up with the end result of production of light, hence bioluminescence. So why make a light? It takes energy, it takes, you, you have to produce those things within your body and all of that takes energy away from other things that you might need. Why would these organisms make light? Not all living things produce light, do they? You don't go out and see a squirrel light up at night. <laughs> Let's you shine a light on it, right? So there must be some reason for it. What, what is the purpose behind that? How does it help that animal to survive? How does it help that organism to survive? Some of those things we know the answer to. Some we don't know the answer to yet. It's just one of those things that you have to marvel over. How is this happening and why is it happening? Answer is still yet to come. Well, back to this monstery looking fish that's within the depths of the ocean. Why do you suppose this fish would send out this lure, if you would, and illuminate it? For attraction. Is it trying to attract a mate? Is it trying to attract a predator? What's it trying to attract? Food. This is called the angler fish, and appropriately so. If any of you fish, an angler is a fisher person. And what this fish is doing is it's fishing. <laughs> and if you're within the depths of the ocean in which the sunlight is not reaching and it's dark, one of the ways in which to be seen is to emit a light. 
So in this case, what this animal does is goes through that process of combining those chemicals in the right combinations. Byproduct of that, if you would, is light, but actually it's the purpose for that particular chemical reaction so that its prey will see this come in, and lo and behold, comes in, thinks it's going to get a meal, but instead becomes a meal. Look at those teeth. Kind of interesting goatee going on there too, I guess. Well, in the case of the anglerfish, if that is to attract its prey, what if you're something like jellyfish? Would you want to attract a predator? So by being visible and by illuminating bioluminescence, by glowing, if you would, giving off this light in an otherwise dark environment, doesn't it make you more visible? It does, but in this case, what takes place is where these animals are, you are getting some amounts of light in the background. Notice it's not as dark back in here. Of course, this was basically a photograph so that was this lit up, you could pick up some of the particulate matter in the back, but it's actually a type of camouflage. So there is other blue lighting associated with the water. Anybody scuba dive? When you go deeper, what color is the water when you get down there? Before you run out of light? Kind of a grayish green color, isn't it? And green has what two colors mixed together to get green? A little bit of art, here we go. All right, it's got some, it's got some blue and yellow in there. So for the predators that might see this by the fact that there is that blue light in there, the ambient blue or blue-green color within the background causes this animal to be more camouflaged within its surrounding. So bioluminescence can be for attracting predators, but it can also be for camouflage to help you blend in so that you don't get eaten. Both those things are pretty important in terms of survival. Well, of course, there's our, our friend from childhood, and even today, there's our firefly. Why do fireflies light up? Go ahead and say it. For mating. It's actually a way of communication in which the male and the female can communicate to one another so that they can find each other, but most importantly, they can communicate to the opposite sex that, hey, I am the same species as you. Because if they're not, then they're not going to reproduce. So how does one, if you would, that you are the same species and would like to visit. <laughs> well, each species of firefly has a distinctive flash pattern. Each species is going to be different from the other. I'm going to show you one in just a few moments that it actually will, if you would, follow the same flash patterns as other species other than itself. Okay? So, one of the ways you advertise, if you would, to the opposite sex of your species if you're a firefly is by having a very distinct flash pattern. The other is by the color of it. Earlier I mentioned you might see a blue light or a yellow or a greenish color. If you think about all the fireflies that you've seen, they're not all the same color flash, are they? You get a different coloration. The length of the flash, some things like blue ghosts, fireflies, when they light up, it's this eerie blue and it stays on and on and then it all goes off. Others will have different patterns of flashing and that's one of the ways you can actually identify a firefly is by the flash pattern, the color and the length, also the pattern. So you've got a color, you've got how long it's going to pattern to it. The flashes that you do, it's pretty complex. But you want to make sure that if you're going to attract a visitor for the means of reproduction that you invite over one of your same species. So complex, but yet you want to make sure that you advertise to the correct one to carry on your species. The flight pattern. 
So it's now it's giving you more intricate. So not only is it the color of your flash, how long are you flashing, the pattern of your flash, how many times do you flash, and then is there a pattern associated with it? Well, let's look at some examples of that. This is the one that most of us have probably seen, common eastern firefly. So one most of us have seen out and about flying around. If you notice its flash, it's the one that has that almost green flash. Not the yellow that you'll see many times in the summer, but it's more of a greenish yellow or green flash. And look at its pattern. It'll drop down. These dark spots represent when the light is off. It comes down and it flashes. One, two, three, four, five, six flashes, and then the light goes out again. It goes up. It drops down. When it gets down to the bottom again, we'll come over here. One, two, three, four, five, six flashes, and then it goes out again. Does that pattern look sort of similar to something you might see within the night sky? The Big Dipper, sometimes known as the Big Dipper Firefly, because of its dipping, flashing at the bottom within the cup, and then not flashing as it comes out. So as it comes along, no flash. One, two, three, four, five flashes of green, and then no flash. Signaling, in this case, the one that's flying is the male. The female is on the ground, and she's flashing back a similar rhythm, but she's not going to have that pattern because she's flightless. She's down on the ground. Synchronized fireflies. How many of you have heard of these? Oh, this is probably the one that most people hear about the most is the synchronized firefly. Big event. Um, it occurs in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. They have a huge, huge um, turnout. As a matter of fact, if you want to go to see this and take the trolley and ride out, you got to get in a lottery to get a ticket. It's become that popular. Now, I'm going to tell you a secret. It happens in other places. <laughs> Congaree National Park, down in Columbia, South Carolina, synchronized fireflies. They also offer programs that you can go synchronize fireflies. Okay. Big event that takes place is a very short time period within the summer. It really depends on moisture and precipitation, usually late May to early June when they synchronize fireflies, um, put on their show for each other and us as well. And then after that, they're pretty much done for the season in terms of, okay. So synchronized, and as the name implies, all of a sudden you're looking out and you see a little bit of light, and then you see more. And then it gets dark again, and they all come on again. It's dark again, they all come on again. And they all almost flash at the same time. Now if you're in a location where there's synchronized fireflies, you have permission to do this. You can actually simulate the flashing time and pattern and get them to respond to you. Now, remember, they're doing this flash pattern for a very important reason, and you don't want to interfere with that too much because we want to make sure there are more fireflies in the future. But yes, you can actually synchronize and get them to pick up on the same flash pattern. And when they're flashing like that, in the background, yeah. Now, I wish I could take credit for this photograph. It's not my photograph. It actually came out of uh, uh, a newspaper. I believe it was in Asheville, a photographer. It was a great article in the Asheville newspaper. And um, I found this, and I was like, wow, that's incredible. Oh, the blue ghost, little tiny, tiny firefly. If you were to see this thing out in the woods, you probably wouldn't recognize it as a lampreday, other than the fact that it's got these elongated wings. It looks beetle-ish, if you would, but knowing it as a firefly, I probably wouldn't even recognize it. Except, if you catch them and put them in that same jar, look at the color of that light. It's this eerie blue-gray color, hence blue ghost fireflies. And when they're all lit up, the fun thing about blue ghost is you don't see them very high off the ground. And when you see them flying across the ground, as if they all light up, 
And remember, they're not flashing. They're going to light up, and they're going to stay lit, and they're going to move, and as they move, they're going to follow the contour. And if you're in an area where the land is somewhat changing, it almost looks like a wave of a blue fog kind of moving across the landscape. It's kind of eerie if you didn't know what it was you're looking at. Here you are out there. Some best times is on a moonless night. because You don't have that background of the light. Other than the stars that are out there, you have very little bit of light pollution, if you would. So the only light being really emitted is from these little tiny beetles. And it's this wave of this blue fog almost moving across. They always stay low to the ground. And that's the male. Remember the male's flying. Where's the female? She's on the ground. She's flightless. So she is going to give her flash. She's going to light up. And hopefully one of these males will come by. And there's lots of them. So many times more than one um, will we'll, we'll head to the ground, if you would. Okay. Um, DuPont State Forest has them. They are found on pretty much that whole area associated with the Table Rock um, Pluton. Table Rock, South Carolina. Uh, so you're going to find them in the South Saluda River Valley. They're on Caesars Head Mountain. They're in the Little River area around DuPont State Forest area. Um, there are also some up in Pisgah National Forest area. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're one of our fireflies. I like to claim them. They're one of ours. Beautiful, beautiful. On and off. That's what they do. They're not going to do this flash thing. There's not this pattern of this thing moving around, but it's on and off with the blue ghost. Ah. Anyone speak French? <laughs> Remember, I said that each species has its own color of flash. It has its own pattern, its own length of time. Turns out there is a species of firefly in which the female will mimic the flash pattern of the male fireflies that are flying above her so that they will think that, hey, that's the right color, that's the right flash pattern, that must be one of my species. I'll head down so we can carry on our species, only to find it's the end of him. She will eat him. <laughs> so, remember that bioluminescence is for many different reasons. One is to attract food, in this case. One is to be hidden from predators if you happen to be one of the prey species. Um, one is for attracting a mate. And in this case, the firefly species has figured that out. Get the right pattern of whom is flying above you and lunch will show up. Okay? Good. Now you've been a pretty quiet audience. Makes me nervous. No, I'm just kidding. Any questions about anything I mentioned in terms of fireflies or bioluminescence in regards to, to fireflies? Um, I noticed fireflies typically are light up right after dusk for just a few hours. Is that typical or do they go all night? Or? Um, it depends on the species and it depends on the climate conditions at that time. Moisture is one of those things that definitely um, has an effect on that. But you're right, normally they're going to start to light up shortly after it's dark, and it'll be for a short amount of time, and then they're done. Yeah. Most of the species in our area, you're not going to see them go for long time periods throughout the night. It's just a matter of hours. Matter of fact, I have to set an alarm clock to wake me up so I can go outside and see the fireflies. Because pretty much once it's dark, I go to bed. Which this time of year, well, it's getting earlier and earlier, but uh, I have to set, if I want to see them, I have to set an alarm clock so I can go out and take a look at them. But yeah, that's a good question. It's usually just after dark, and then it lasts for, depending on um, you know, a matter of hours. All right, well, we're going to shift gears a little bit because this talk is, yes?
Well, there's a different reproductive strategy, but in this particular case, they can't mate with one another. She attracts basically the male down by flashing the right patterns and colors and things of that nature. It comes down, and the whole purpose is for feeding purposes, not for reproduction. At least not directly. She's going to get energy, and it takes energy to reproduce. No. She's a different species. She is mimicking the color and the pattern of the species that are flying above her. But different species. But hmm? that the fireflies really like taller grasses, and so um, I, I don't see as many, and I don't have as much tall grass. So where, what, what is it they like? I mean, if you have just short grass, are you going to see? You're going to see fewer. You're going to see fewer fireflies in short grass. That you don't. You're not really tall, tall grasses yeah. like long, you know, tall blue stem or something of that nature. Uh, but yeah, they're really short grass. You, you, you're not going to see the same number of them. It's going to have fewer of them. So this is that, also an interesting thing. If you happen to have fireflies in an area that you are, just remember the females can't fly. They're on the ground. So as you're walking around, watch where you step. Yes, she, she has her on patterns, flash, everything that will to attract for reproduction. They do. They do. Firefly larvae do light up, and sometimes that's where you'll find the word glowworm. But a glowworm does not have to be just the larva, or it's not just the larva of firefly species. Glowworms can also include some of the beetles. A really cool beetle that's called a, um, it's a, it's a, a gnat that lays its eggs on fungi. And its larva illuminates, bioilluminates, and it's this beautiful blue color on just each end. So yes, it's not just the adult stage. In many of them, it's the larval stage as well. Good questions. All right, we're going to move to fungi, if you would. A different kingdom. So we have an idea of how this takes place and why it takes place in terms of animals. But what about this fungi? What, what the world's going on there? Mushroom. I understand there was a mushroom talk. A mushroom talk. Maybe you attended that. All right, time for the quiz. <laughs> Keep your hands high. Anybody? Know what kind of mushroom that is? Not jack o' lantern. Not jack o' lantern. It's a good guess. <laughs> the honey mushroom, and if you look, it almost looks like a honey-colored mushroom. Um, honey mushrooms. Um, honey mushrooms are, there's actually several different species within this genera, um, but they are the ones that early on bioluminescence was observed in because in the daytime, this is what a honey mushroom looks like, but at night, this is what it looks like. And of course, we're looking underneath it. Notice you almost get this eerie green glow about it. It's not very bright. If you were to go out on a full moon, very difficult to see this. One of the best places to see the bioluminescence of fungi is in very, very dark conditions. Um, so on a moonless night, actually a nice cloud moonless night, where you don't even have starlight out in there. Very, very little, because it's going to be a very faint, eerie glow. It's not going to be a bright light that you're going to find. Almost to the point that you're questioning, am I? really seeing light or am I imagining that I'm seeing light? Okay. Of course, the fruiting part of the mushroom is going to bioilluminate, but also the body of many of the species. When you see a mushroom, what you're seeing is the fruiting part, if you would. That's the reproductive part. It comes up and has the spores. But the body or the main part of the fungi is known as mycelium. 
And it's these long, stringy masses, some of them so large that they literally cover square miles. The largest living organism on the planet Earth is a species of honey mushroom. And it is literally miles in terms of the surface area. How do they know it's the same species? How do they know it's the same individual? DNA. 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 So these things spread out. They're in there. And also, they bioilluminate. And many times you'll see this sort of greenish blue coloration coming out of a piece of wood. I've seen hillsides of this light up, and you almost could not tell the difference between the stars in the sky and the foxfire of the hillside glowing. This is one of the things we refer to as foxfire. Foxfire, sort of uh, basically a, a mistranslation of fox fire, F A U X, false fire. We call it foxfire. And there's actually two different types of foxfire. There's one that is atmospheric, foxfire in the night sky, but this foxfire is from bioluminescence. In other words, within that mycelial tissue, there is that chemical reaction taking place with all those chemicals I'm in the presence of oxygen and producing this light that glows. A lot of times you'll see it on wood and it looks sort of like a bluish stain. No, there are some blue stain fungi as well that don't bioilluminate. But um, and a lot of times you'll see this and you go out and you try to find it and it's glowing. And the fun thing is it'll light up and then you try to find it and it gets dark and you pick it up and you can't find it. What's glowing? Where's this light getting from? By the way, why, why does fungi produce light? Why does it, what is this whole thing with bioluminescence in a fungi? They're not attracted to pollinator, are they? They don't flower. Where do they get their food? They basically are eating material that has broken down. Sometimes they, they kind of get ahead of they they don't wait for the tree to die. They, they start eating some of the materials within there and breaking it down, which causes some problems within, within certain species of trees, with species of fungi. So they're basically decomposing rotting material. Do you need light to do that? One of the theories is maybe the idea is you attract a spore disperser. Maybe that light attracts an animal that will be come in, take the spore, and move it about. It turns out that fungi have many, many different mechanisms for spreading their spores. Things like puff balls, so when you step on it or the wind goes across. Just that dispersal of those very fine spores and being moved by wind and water. They do a pretty good job of dispersing those spores by just using wind and water and other mechanisms. So, but that's a theory. Maybe that's why they're doing it. Remember that gnat worm associated with it? There are many species of flies that utilize fungus to lay their eggs on. The eggs hatch out into a larva and the larva feed upon that mushroom. So maybe in some way, form, or fashion, it has to do with that life cycle of, of the insect. But how would that be advantageous to the mushroom? We don't know. That's one of those things you just kind of have to marvel at. It just does it. And because it does it, in some way, form, or fashion, it helps things continue to function in the manner in which they have. Anybody gaining, anybody losing? Great question. Ah. Notice we've got a tree. And if you look upon it, you'll see these nice fruiting bodies of this fungi that's growing on there. What color is that? It's pumpkin orange, isn't it? <laughs> that's one of the reasons that this fungi gets the name of Jack O'Lantern. This is the jack-o'-lantern fungi. 
we have these growing in our area. This is the one you also have to be really knowledgeable about because there's another one that looks very similar, chicken of the woods, which is a, uh, if, if you know how and you don't have any allergic reactions, it, it is one of the delicacies of, of mushroom foragers is, is, is that particular one. This one, uh, the literature refers to it as um, gastric distress, sweating, increase in heart rate, a few other things. <laughs> kind of goes into that whole Halloween thing again, doesn't it? This idea of a jack-o'-lantern. It gets the common name once again because not only of this orangey coloration that's pumpkin orange, like that of the pumpkin, but it also is bioluminescent. It too is like that eerie green glow that in the full moon you would not see. Um, I was sharing with someone earlier before I began the presentation I received a call from uh, someone from the New York Times who wanted to schedule their time of travel to fly down to be here at the appropriate time so they could be here and photograph the bioluminescence of the jack-o'-lantern under the full moon. <laughs> I said, have you heard of something called Photoshop? <laughs> or one of those other many types of things that one might utilize. I said, to do that, you're going to need to put lots of images together. We'll take you out on a moonless night. <laughs> we'll also take you out in the daytime, let you get a picture of what it looks like in the daytime. And then we'll take some and go into a very dark, dark, dark area and let you photograph it. And you can put all the things together if you would like. But once again, that glow off of there, off of this mushroom, is this really faint, faint glow, almost an eerie green color. Once again, adding to this idea of being the Jack O' Lantern. It's in the fall of the year. It's pumpkin orange and it has this eerie glow. A little spooky, but not the glow of our jack-o'-lantern pumpkin. All right. What questions can I answer for you? Do fireflies and the fungi, um, if it were dark during the day, would they be producing this light? Or is it something that the darkness triggers? Yes you, yes, you, yes, you can take them and you can take a firefly or fungi and you can actually take things that behave differently in the absence of light and put them in the absence of light. In other words, take them out in the daytime, take them into a dark area, they light up. But are they lit up during the day but we can't see it is my question. Um, they don't light during the day. At least the fireflies don't light okay. during the day. And there are actually some fireflies that don't have a light at all. For whatever reason, evolutionarily, the need for that light has been lost. So <laughs> they continue as a species, but they don't have to light up. They are. What else? Matter of fact, there's a lot of different fungi that's eaten by wildlife. And it's kind of interesting to see what part they eat. Red squirrels typically seem to like the stems. Gray squirrels typically like the cap. Because it works out well in areas where they're both in the same location. You eat the stem, I'll eat the cap. Get to eat. Oh, no. Yes, Beth. Um, you're going to typically find most of the ones we've talked about in oak hickory forest. So if you go out into a pine forest, you're not necessarily going there to see these. So typically in a hardwood forest, uh, usually with a lot of rich organic material in terms of the fungi, you've got lots of material. If you don't have a lot, then you'll also have a lot of what they call large woody debris. So if you've got large fallen over logs and things of that nature, so you've got lots of food source in there. 
I also notice when do you see the greatest number of fungi? After rains. They're just sitting there waiting for the right conditions. So in areas that are more xeric in nature, in other words, drier in nature, you're going to have a different group of fungi and you're going to have a less amount of those. These guys, jack-o'-lantern, honey mushrooms, and there's actually several others that bioluminesce. Uh, to hardwoods, moist soils, rich in organic material. You can actually, I saw this the other day, an advertisement popped up that you can, you can buy a bag of glowing fungi. Basically, I guess it's got spores in it. I, I, I don't know. I, I didn't read into it that in depth, but it was kind of this black bag and it had this eerie green writing on it. And it was for Halloween, but you can, but you can inoculate them. Matter of fact, I actually heard that one possibility might be really cool to illuminate the entranceway to an amphitheater would be to plant foxfire and honey mushrooms up through the area. And they were like, that'd be cool, but better make sure there's not any growing in the aisles. You need total darkness in the aisles. <laughs> or people who can see really good. Yes, sir. Do all the fireflies seem to eliminate uh, about the year? It is staggered depending on the species. So they're, it's going to be warmer conditions before they're going to do so. But there are certain ones that, that have a, a specific time of the summer in which they're going to, like the synchronized fireflies, typically late May, early June. And then after that, no great number of them, if at all. Pretty close. Mm -hmm. Blue ghost is about the same time. Does that mean in the winter we're not going to see them at uh, all? I wouldn't say not at all, but it's pretty unusual to see a firefly in the winter time in, in, in this area. What about other kinds? Oh, yeah, they're still bioluminescence. Um, the fall of the year happens to be the most productive time of the year for fungi. If you think about it, there's a lot of fungi in the fall of the year. So therefore, by increasing the diversity that's out there, the probability of, of having a species that bioluminesce is higher, but also the sheer number of individuals that are out there. Now, this is just a question that crosses my mind about cuts. Does it have any effect when it runs over, say, a full It, it can, yes. Uh, w one of the things that can happen, depends on the amount that you have, is one of the things that kudzu can do is actually get up into trees and things of that nature and kill the tree. So what will happen a lot of times is you lose your canopy layer or you lose your understory layer, the shorter trees. And what that does is it allows more sunlight to come in, which can cause warmer temperatures, which depending on what's going on, but also can make it drier. So by the loss of the canopy species or understory, even shrubs, that die back because of the, the kudzu coming in and out, competing them for space, light, um, can increase sunlight, which can increase temperature, as well as decrease moisture levels. On NPR the other day, this is not related to this. Uh oh. <laughs> no, it's so. There was a study, evidently, for the last 10 years in Germany, they had these nature preserves, and they can really counting the number of flying insects. And they said that over the last 10 years, over 65% of the flying insects have disappeared. And the question was, well, do you think that's just, you know, natural to those preserves? And he said, no, I don't think so. So what is he thinking, what's happening with the flying insects? And they were talking about the impact that has when you lose them. Okay, uh, the 65% the was that 65% of, of biomass, in other words, a number that they're seeing, or 65% of decrease in the number of species kinds? No, it was the number, didn't you? Yeah. Okay, so population. population. So if you were, if you were seeing... It's gone. Okay, if you were yeah. seeing 10,000, now you're seeing 60, okay. Yeah. There are a lot of different factors that can affect flying animals, including fireflies. Uh, there are, it could be things associated with things that are the law.
loss of something within their particular area, the loss of a food source. Um, it could be the introduction of something into their location, something that might be toxic to them. Um, there's a whole parameter of things that could, could affect. But part of my question is, do you have any sense that that is happening everywhere else? Because that was one of the questions that was put to the researcher, and they said, we have no reason to think that in this nature preserve that it would be any different anywhere else because we're not doing anything to, you know, mm -hmm. we're not spraying, we're mm -hmm. not doing all those things that in other areas that we know might affect the number of Right. Insects. You know, and I think it depends on the species you're looking at, but in general, a lot of data is showing that there is a decrease, but that can also be cyclic and it can also fluctuate depending on what's going on. For example, thinking of the color orange and things that flies makes me think about monarch butterflies. Oh, yeah. So tons and tons tons of monarch butterflies. How do you quantify a ton of monarchs? I'm not sure, but um, <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Or, or this little boy told me the other day, there are lots of them. I saw lots and lots. I didn't see so many the previous year. But one of the things that we know that happened was when they got to their wintering grounds a few years ago, they had really extreme cold conditions, and a large percentage of the population died back. So therefore, they could not move back to begin those generations. So the population declined because of something that occurred in their overwintering grounds. Um, so it could be. It could be natural caused events. Um, it could be anthropogenic, man-made. It could be a combination of both. Have, have I personally noticed a decrease? I, I, depends on where I am. What else can I answer? Yes? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you could, you could have a decrease in that population in one year, and the next year it might rebound. And that's you're going to be, can be cyclical. Um, but this was over a 10-year period. These researchers yeah. are yeah. alive at mm -hmm. what's happening. It's mm -hmm. not just cyclical. Right. And okay. Yeah, and, I, yeah, and I, 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 I don't have enough information on that to be able to, to give you a, a, a answer one way or the other is, well, is they, there? They don't have an answer. Yeah, they don't have an answer, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. One of your comments was about when someone asked about the height of the grass. Mm -hmm. And of course, when we mow the lawn, I guess we're killing the female ladybugs. Uh, they, they, Some, some, of, some of them you could, but they're going to be lying pretty close to the ground. Yeah. And, there's some, and there are actually some locations where they know that they have fireflies that they also don't allow access to because they know they're there. They can, yes. They can. Yeah, they, they're, they're, they can't fly, but they, they are larvae. They do have little structures that allow them to be able to, to move. So they can crawl up and down stems. On the ground, usually. Sometimes on a stem, sometimes on a small blade of grass, like the photograph that was there, they worked on a blade of grass. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I will be more than glad to stay around and answer any questions that you might have, um, but also I want to be... Uh, respectful of your time because uh, time is one of those things that's very valuable. So I would like to close in saying thank you to each of you for giving me a gift to which I cannot return to you. And that's your time. You could have chose to be anywhere else today, but you chose to give me an hour of your life. So I greatly appreciate it and I hope it was worth your time.